This is an interview with Daniel Hawk for the SEC Historical Society's Virtual Museum and Archive on the History of Financial Regulation. Today is June 2nd, 2021, and I'm Kenneth Durr. Daniel, thank you for inviting me over to uh, Arnold and Porter. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to talk to you today. My pleasure. Um, I want to start by going back to the, the early days. Uh, touch a little bit on your undergrad experience and how you got interested in law. Sure. So um, I was born in Washington, D.C. at George Washington Hospital and grew up in the District of Columbia. Uh, my father was a lawyer in Washington. Uh, he's now retired. Uh, and he had a profound influence on my interest in the law. Uh, I went to Tulane University in New Orleans uh, and had a roommate who was a law student at Tulane Law School. And I, I saw uh, what his training was like and it appealed to me, so uh, I applied to law school. Did you ever think about securities law any time in there? I, I did not, actually. I, I, when I graduated from law school, I, I became a litigator for lack of you know, any particular area that I wanted to concentrate in uh, and began my career as a, litiga as a litigator for roughly 10 years before I went to the SEC. Okay, so you were at BU for law school? I went to Boston University School of Law. I graduated in 1989. Okay, and then you went to a, a, a local DC firm. Yes, it was a, a, a Washington business firm. It was, uh, I would characterize it as a small to mid-sized firm called Tucker, Flyer, and Lewis. Uh, it was a wonderful tr uh, training experience. I, I was frequently uh, put into situations where uh, I had to learn by the seat of my pants, and uh, I, I did, and, and prepared me well when I ultimately decided to go to the commission. Why did you decide to go to the commission? So in my upbringing, I had known many Washington lawyers who, uh, who had worked in the government and who espoused the, the virtues of public service. Uh, and in my family, public service was something that uh, I would say uh, was expected and, and encouraged. Uh, and by the time I had been out of law school for 10 years, I realized I had a one-year-old uh, baby and thought that if I didn't go into the government now, I probably never would. Mm -hmm. so, so what did you bring to, to the SEC from your, your law practice? Most people go straight into the, the commission, you know, and, and so what was the difference for you? I, I think the difference was that I got the benefit of training from uh, a, a law firm that was willing to give me the experience that I needed to grow. Uh, it, was, it was a very special law firm in the sense that everybody knew each other, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of camaraderie, um, and there was an expectation that as a lawyer that you know, public service was something to be encouraged. Okay. So at the commission, did you go to work for Stephen Cutler? I no. did. Actually, it was Dick Walker was the director at the time. Okay. Steve was the deputy director. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, went, I had become a partner in my law firm in 1996 and then decided after about a year of being a partner that I, I really wanted to go to the SEC. I, I applied, I, I got the job, and I became a staff attorney uh, in the Division of Enforcement. And this, this was about 1999. Okay. What does a staff attorney do? So a staff attorney in the Division of Enforcement is, a, is an exalted position. It, it's really uh, the highest calling, if, if I had to say. Um, the staff attorney is responsible for organizing the investigation plan, executing on an investigation plan, learning the, the record, uh, mastering the exhibits, mastering the law that's applicable to the conduct, and then ultimately turning an investigation into an enforcement recommendation if it's warranted. And then once you turn it into a recommendation, that goes to the commission, right? It, it goes, well, it goes to the uh, front office of enforcement who reviews it and decides based on what they're seeing across the division whether it merits uh, consideration by the commission. Uh, and then once it goes to the commission, it's reviewed by various divisions, operating divisions, and individual commissioners 
and then a meeting is held in a closed commission meeting and the commission acts on the recommendation. And does it get to be your case? It, it gets, it, it, as a staff attorney, it, it's your case except to the extent that it's your supervisor's cases and the commission's case and everybody else who has a piece of it. Right. So when the newspaper articles come out, the supervisor's name is usually on it, I suppose. That's correct. Yeah. It's a well-worn tradition. Okay. Um, so you became branch chief in, in 2002. So, yeah, so my first case was the Arthur Anderson case arising out of the waste management restatement. And at the time, that restatement was the largest restatement in the history of the United States. I arrived at the commission in August of 1999, and Dick Walker and Steve Cutler set a deadline for me when they assigned me the Arthur Anderson case and said, uh, we'd like to have a recommendation, if any, from you by uh, Memorial Day of 2000. Uh, so I proceeded to schedule testimony uh, of the Arthur Anderson witnesses. And I think I took roughly 45 days of individual testimony over a six-month period uh, to make the Memorial Day deadline. Um, at that time, uh, I was, I was, a decision was made to extend the investigation through the summer and I was given a Labor Day deadline uh, to, bring, uh, to bring the case. Uh, so by Labor Day of 2000, we uh, issued uh, Wells notices uh, and, and began the process of wrapping up the case. At that point, uh, I had been through a full cycle of uh, investigations as a senior counsel and staff attorney. Uh, I applied to become a branch chief. Uh, at the time, I was in um, Jim, Jim Kaufman's uh, assistant director group. Uh, we were in Tom Newkirk's associate group. And I applied for a branch chief in a different assistant director group, with Scott mm. Freestaff. Uh, which I ultimately got, and then moved groups, which was somewhat unusual in the in the division at that time to to move to become a branch chief in a group that you were not the, a staff attorney in. Mm -hmm. Sounds like the performance on the Arthur Arthur Anderson case was pretty important for moving your career along. Is that very, the case very much so? Um, you know, I, I had been out of law school for ten years when I when I undertook the case. Uh, I, I think uh, Steve. Cutler in particular uh, had uh, shown an interest in the work that I was doing uh, and encouraged me to uh, work hard and to, to get the case done quickly, and I did, uh, with the help of, of uh, an accountant on the case and a trial counsel. Uh, and uh, that served as the foundation for my promotion to branch chief. Okay. Another early case that showed up in my research was the Bank of America securities case. A very significant case under Section 17A and B of the Exchange Act. Uh, Bank of America Securities was a broker dealer. Uh, and in the course of, the, of an investigation uh, into uh, its uh, research, um, we ran into difficulty with the firm concerning uh, its production of certain materials. Uh, and the order against Bank of America Securities uh, related to the firm's violations of Section 17A and 17B of the Exchange Act, which the firm neither admitted nor denied. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, what, what do you call that? The, a, a um, What's the technical term? It would have been a cease and desist order okay. on a neither admit nor deny basis, okay. and the firm paid a $10 million penalty for failure to comply with the uh, provisions of Section 17A and B of the Exchange Act. Okay. So you're pretty steeped in, into the, the enforcement group at this point. Um, and the opportunity comes up to, to go to the region. Correct. So I, I had worked for Scott Freestad, who was an assistant director at the time. And uh, Scott was a, 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 a terrific uh, uh, leader, supervisor, mentor, and 
obviously I aspired to, uh, to a, a higher level of involvement in the Division of Enforcement. But I knew that, um, that you know, it would take many years if I, if I you know, wasn't creative and, and energetic in the way I approached my job. And one day I was walking in the hallway after having come back from a lunch with Scott where uh, he had convinced me that uh, I had another round of cases in me as a branch chief and that I shouldn't leave the agency. Uh, and, uh, and I saw Steve Cutler in the hallway after that lunch and he asked me, did I want to go to Philadelphia to run the enforcement program? Uh, and my mother-in-law at the time lived in uh, uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, my in-laws, and uh, that was close enough to Philadelphia for me, uh, and I went to Philadelphia uh, a after having been a branch chief in the Division of Enforcement. And what's significant about that is that I, I skipped over the assistant director role and went directly into a senior officer uh, position, which was, which was, I would say, highly unusual. Now, there was a time when the regions were kind of where it was at. A, a lot of action was out there. Um, but probably not so much in the period we're talking about. Um, did you have any reservations, uh, you know, leaving HQ and, and going out to the, the hinterlands? I did. I, I, there were um, some people who thought that given my uh, career path, the cases I had worked on, that my my opportunities as a branch chief in the home office might be actually greater than going to Philadelphia as the head of enforcement. Uh, what I learned when I got to Philadelphia was that it was an office that was on the move, that they had been doing a number of the market timing and late trading cases and a number of the revenue sharing or, or what we called shelf space cases and the office had tremendous energy and momentum under my predecessor, Ari Gabine. You know, Ari, Steve and Ari had been talking about the possibility of who they were going to hire as the head of enforcement. Mary Jo Gillette, who had been the head of enforcement, was promoted to become the regional director in the Chicago office. And I succeeded Mary Jo in her position as associate director in Philadelphia. Okay. The Philadelphia office had a, a, a storied reputation. They'd brought many significant cases over the years. And they had this momentum. Um, Philadelphia was an important uh, location for the SEC. The SEC had actually uh, uh, re uh, removed to Philadelphia during World War II, where it became the, the, the uh, uh, home office of the commission for many years in the um, Philadelphia Athletic Club. So Philadelphia had a connection uh, to the SEC that was unique. And other aspects of it were the SEC actually sits in the Philadelphia region. So there was another opportunity to establish relationships with, uh, between the home office and the regions that I thought was interesting. And the fact that I was coming out of the home office meant that um, I had an opportunity that, that few people do to really work both in the home office and in the regions and see if I could bring some harmony to some of those relationships. So you got to see both sides of things. I, I did. And, and the operations in the region were very different than in the home office yeah. at the time. Tell me about Ari Gabinet and, and how he ran things and, and how his personality influenced the, the, re, the region. Uh, Ari, Ari was, is a larger than life personality. He was very energetic in the way that he, um, he, he ran the office. Uh, he was, uh, I would say, an asset management attorney by training. Uh, I, think, I believe Ari was at the Deckert firm and, and did a lot of investment advisor and investment management work. Um, Ari had a tremendous amount of energy and, and enthusiasm. He was very creative in the way that he approached uh, problem solving. Um, he, he was practical uh, and efficient 
Um, I, I think that he got the office moving in a way that historically it had not. And as a result, in part because of his personality and because of his energy level, um, it really infected the office with a sense of mission and, and an opportunity to do some pretty good things. A lot of the regions develop this character based on the kind of work they do. You know, mutual funds in Boston and oil and gas and in Fort Worth. Um, what was, did Philadelphia have any of that? Was there some kind of economic underpinning to, to what it was about? It, it did. In Philadelphia, there, there was a huge manufacturing base uh, over the years and a lot of money. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic region is home to trillions of dollars in assets under management with some very large uh, market participants in our region. So necessarily, the Philadelphia office had to have a very strong examination and inspections program. And, and it did. It, it, it's one of the few uh, uh, regional offices whose exam program was larger than its enforcement program. Uh, and the result was that um, the office generated many high quality exam referrals, both from the investment advisor program and from the broker dealer program. The, the result of that was that uh, Philly, I think, had three areas that were the priority for me as regional director. The first was to enhance the exam program and the number and quality of referrals that came to enforcement from that program. The second area was specialized in the sense that the office had developed expertise in municipal securities and had unique expertise uh, because of the nature of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the way that uh, small towns and cities throughout Pennsylvania would raise money uh, Philadelphia developed expertise in the municipal bond market mm -hmm. and that was an area of priority. And then the third priority that I had was really to look for places where retail investors were most easily separated from their money and develop investigative plans to look for situations where uh, people were the victim of hard to detect frauds or other serious misconduct. Uh, that took advantage of them or that sought to, uh, to divest them from their hard-earned money. Yeah, I think when Chairman Cox appointed you um, as director, there was a phrase in there about elderly fraud was going to be uh, a, a, an important point of emphasis. Is this yeah. part of what you're telling me here? Yeah, I, I think there was a general view that as the baby boomer generation aged and as it had accumulated a great deal of wealth, that there was concern at the commission that seniors were, uh, who had traditionally been targets of opportunity for scammers and fraudsters, that with the aging population, there would be an increase in the number of, of actions or, or, or schemes targeted to seniors. Uh, and Chairman Cox was very con concerned about making sure that we were focused on those types of issues. Okay. Before we move you into director, there's, there's one more thing I want to talk about, which I think took place before that, which is this electronic spider case. Sure. Um, I, I just can't pass up something with a, with a moniker <laughs> like that. So lay so that one out. There, there's an interesting story behind what we called the Estonian spider case. Um, this was a case that came in from a, an informant who had noticed a spike in the volume of a pharmaceutical company that was unexplained. There were no news events that were obvious and there was a, a surge in volume that she didn't understand. And we, um, we, we looked at that concern and complaint and determined that she was correct, that there appeared to have been a, a surge in volume in this pharmaceutical company, and that it happened to coincide with a news announcement that had been issued through a commercial news wire. Um, and that established a, an investigative lead that we then used to determine that the 
uh, defendant was a young man named Oliver Peak in Estonia, in, in Tallinn, Estonia. And he was roughly 24 years old, and he was a programmer. And he had figured out how to hack into the, new, the commercial news wires database of, of impending news announcements. I, we called, I think, as I recall, we called the scheme a clever and pernicious fraud at the time. But what was significant about it was the way that it was discovered. And it was discovered using da data analytics, a very crude, very rough form of data analytics that al allowed us to track Mr. Peake's trading across many, many different types of securities. A and then we were able to match up that trading with corresponding news announcements that he had accessed uh, usually a few seconds or minutes earlier uh, through his spider program that he had launched okay. on the newswire. The, the case was highly significant because it was, a, it was the first indication that we had that trading activity was highly uh, correlated to access to material non-public information. And although it looked like insider trading, because it involved hacking, it involved uh, new legal theories and new approaches to investigations that we had to undertake in order to be able to do these cases successfully. Yeah, and the data analytics are going to become important. The data analytics yeah. become very important yeah. because of what we learned in the Estonian case. Okay. Um, anything else that that did Chairman Cox sit you down and say, I, I want you to run the regional office, or how did that work? Did so he invited me in for an interview. Um, you know, Ari had, I, I had arrived at the office in March of 2005 as the associate director. Um, about six months after I arrived, I had moved my family, I had bought a new house, and Ari announced that he was going to be leaving. So. I had never really entertained the idea of becoming the regional director. I, was, I had just been promoted into the associate position. I had skipped a level of management to become an associate director. And I really put my hat in the ring just as a means of perhaps making it tougher on the other people who were interested in applying if they were going to become my boss. Um, and I did that and ultimately met with the chairman and, and uh, Linda Thompson and uh, Lori Richards, who was the head of OC at the time. Uh, and they selected me to become the next director. Okay. Uh, chairman Cox had a very, uh, what I would say, different and ambitious program uh, with respect to involvement of the regional offices in the national enforcement program. And through a series of retreats and meetings that Chairman Cox conducted with the regional directors around the country, uh, we would travel to different cities and meet as a group with the chair and his general counsel and a number of agency directors to talk about how the regional offices could help the national enforcement program. What was his vision exactly? Well, I think his vision was a more empowering view of the regional offices in the sense that um, bringing, them, bringing them into the national program's uh, uh, enforcement priorities in a more concerted way than historically had been in recent years. Um, he did that by, in the first instance, making uh, the district offices regional offices. So when I went to Philadelphia, uh, it was as the district administrator. And within two or three years of Chairman Cox's arrival, he, he and the commission had amended the, the Code of Federal Regulations to change the designation of the district offices to regional offices. So Philadelphia had been a district office under the New York regional office, and now under Chairman Cox became the Philadelphia regional office, as it had been prior to Chairman Levitt's creation of the district offices. Right. 
Was there some sort of systematic uh, implementation of, of sort of information sharing um, cases, things like that, that he was looking at as far as integrating the regions? He, he was. I mean, I think he wanted to um, promote the idea that as a national enforcement program, the regional offices and the home office associate directors were, were one united program. Uh, and he, he did this by convening these meetings and by um, uh, instilling uh, a sense within the regions that their enforcement efforts were integral to the national program. So your job is to go out and implement this. It, it was, and you know, my view was that you know Philadelphia sat halfway between Washington and New York. And that it was important that, you know, like most regional offices, that it, it focus on the things that it's really good at. And that meant taking advantage of the fact that we had a very prominent exam program that was in all of the major reg regulated entities in our region at various times, that we had a strong enforcement group, uh, and that because of the revenue sharing and late trading cases that the office had done, Philadelphia was poised to do cases of national import. And my view was that that was how it could best contribute to the national program. Okay. Let's um, go into a little bit of depth on the examination program. Sure. Um, and tangentially with that, how you worked with, with OC. So the head of the exam program in Philadelphia is a woman named Joy Thompson, who is a very experienced lawyer and longtime SEC um, uh, employee. Uh, she, I, I believe, uh, has held the position of acting director of the Philadelphia Regional Office on multiple occasions as, as directors came and go, mm -hmm. came and went, Joy would step in. So she had a very good sense of the office. Um, and the exam program was, as I would s said, is very large. It had a, a large broker-dealer program, a large investment uh, management inspection and examinations program, and a large investment advisor inspections and examinations program. And a range of cases came out of our exam program that formed the basis for um, actions that the enforcement group would then bring. Uh, and there were a number of cases, including, for example, a case against an individual named Donald Anthony Walker Young, uh, who was engaged in a Ponzi scheme that the examiners found and referred to enforcement involving um, that the, the, some of the victims were heirs to the, uh, the Strawbridge's uh, fortune. Uh, in Philadelphia. And so the, the Donald Anthony Walker Young case was a, 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 a very good example of the exam, examiners working hand in hand with the enforcement staff to bring an enforcement action to shut down uh, a, a fraud as it was happening. What percentage of cases would have worked that way? Was it 50 50? Uh... Uh, it was not 50 50. Uh, you know, the, the Typically, the exam program will refer matters that involve willful misconduct. So matters that fall short of willful misconduct, that where there's either negligence or other uh, violations, often are resolved through the deficiency process. But in, in a fair percentage of cases, maybe 10 to 20 percent of the cases that came out of the exam program would yield an enforcement referral sometimes more, sometimes less, um, that the enforcement staff would then investigate to determine whether or not there were violations. And over the years, the Philadelphia staff brought many of these types of exam referral cases that culminated in enforcement actions. Okay. Uh, sticking with exams and inspections a little bit, um, you know, the, the creation of OC was there was, there was always a little controversy. Um, you've got this, in some respects, independent group within your group. 
Um, tell me how you worked that. Uh, did you sit down with Lori Richards and, uh, on repeated occasions and kind of divvy things up? Um, how, how did the relationship work? So in Philadelphia, the, because the home office of the SEC headquarters was in the Philadelphia region, the Philadelphia office enjoyed a unique relationship with the home office. So for example, uh, our office would team with OC on certain examinations in the mid-Atlantic region where OC wanted to better understand certain types of conduct that they were seeing nationwide. The ability to conduct joint exams with the Philadelphia office enabled that OC leadership to get information about uh, practices and products and services that registrants in our area were engaged in. And so a lot of the work that uh, the Philadelphia office did was in tandem with examiners in, in OC, uh, in the home office, and oftentimes around the country. We, our examiners would be dispatched to other regional offices where we had expertise on matters that would benefit their offices. Okay, so you had examiners and they weren't necessarily part of OC, is that, is that right? So the examiners were part of OC. Okay. They, they existed in the regions within the broker-dealer exam program and within the investment advisor exam program, but, and they were managed by Lori Richards out of Washington. In 2011 or 12, um, uh, Carlo De Florio became the director of OC and, uh, and at the time uh, was looking to establish a national exam program very similar in concept to the national enforcement program that had previously been established. Mm -hmm. And that meant that, um, that the regional offices would have a more direct reporting role to the leadership in OC concerning the exam work that they were doing. Okay. Anything else we should touch on with exa examinations and inspections? You know, I think that the restructuring that was done in OC that followed the e enforcement program benefited from knowing what the benefits and, you know, what the positives and negatives were from the enforcement restructuring. So I chaired the technology committee of the OC restructuring. And in that, I co-chaired it with a woman named Kim Garber. And our role was to figure out what, exam, what technology examiners needed to be able to conduct their examinations. And so it was, a, it was a comprehensive realignment of the exam program across all aspects, just like enforcement had done, but with unique focus on those things that examiners require in order to do their jobs. And my role was to look at the, uh, the technology that the examiners were using to look for ways to improve their uh, surveillance and their uh, examination work when they're inside registrants. Okay. I want to shift gears and talk sure. about some cases, okay. which are always fun. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, Put the Putnam pay to play case was one of the earlier ones under your, your leadership. So Putnam had begun as a revenue sharing case, I believe, uh, before I arrived. And I had inherited a number of case, cases like that that Ari had, uh, that had begun under Ari's tenure and that uh, my, my colleagues in the office continued to work on when I was there. I had a relatively light touch on those matters, but what was significant about them was that they were, they were national cases in scale. In, in a number of uh, late trading and market timing cases and revenue sharing cases, the penalties uh, were in the tens or in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars. And it was, those were really the catalyst that the Philadelphia office used to push off of that really became the foundation for the work that it did over the, my tenure, over the ensuing eight years. So I would look at a Putnam or a PIMCO or one of those types of cases as really being, they, they were less, the, the market timing and late trading cases 
were really a regional phenomenon. They, those cases were not, had not really been done out of the home office. So when I came to the regions, they spoke in a vernacular relating to those types of cases that mm -hmm. were, was very different than what I was used to. After those cases sort of wound their way through the system, a lot of the lessons learned about working across offices, working in teams, um, coordinating across offices, uh, those lessons learned began to inform the way that Philadelphia did business with other regional offices in the home office during my tenure. Like Boston, for example, I think they had a lot of market timing cases. Did you work closely with we, Boston? We did. Um, David Burgers, when he became the director, Walter Rashardi had been the director there, and then David Burgers. Uh, Walter became the deputy director uh, of enforcement when David became the director of the Boston office, and David and I worked very closely. Uh, I was in Philadelphia, he was in Boston, and, and we had very similar dockets with the market timing, late trading, and revenue sharing cases. Okay. There's another one called the Joseph Forte. 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 Um, you worked with the CFTC on this one? We did. This was a um, this was a Ponzi scheme that arose shortly after the Madoff uh, Ponzi scheme. Uh, what happened with Madoff was our office was was uh, fortunately unaffected by the Madoff uh, uh, issues. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, we, we were tasked with, um, you know, following up on a number of the Ponzi schemes that sort of became apparent after the Madoff case. One of those cases was a Ponzi scheme involving Joseph Forte, who had, had sort of used affinity type uh, practices to uh, secure roughly $50 million in investor assets that, that were, were not in, actually invested in the things that he had mm -hmm. indicated to investors he was investing in. So it was cla a classic. Classic Ponzi scheme. Okay. Um, how did you end up breaking that? We, we shut that down. Uh, the, we, we coordinated very closely with the CFTC and with the cr uh, criminal authorities. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a corresponding CFTC case uh, uh, on that matter, uh, and uh, we obtained you know, the full range of injunctive and monetary relief that the commission was entitled to obtain. You know, there was some difficult clawback litigation, as I recall, from that case that sort of tested the proposition of you know, when an innocent party receives the proceeds of a Ponzi-type fraud from another investor, you know, what the policy should be about clawing back those funds. Uh, and the Forte case presented a number of those challenging type issues. Mm. What, what, did you resolve any of those? Uh, we litigated a number of them okay. with respect to claims against recipients of his proceeds. Mr. Forte had uh, made a practice of donating uh, certain proceeds that he received to certain institutions that were innocent recipients of of those funds. Um, and so we had to proceed with uh, clawback litigation in certain instances to recover those proceeds. There's one more I want to talk about sure. just because it ma made national headlines, which is the Deepwater Horizon thing and, yes. and BP. Um, uh, t tell me how, how that came into your portfolio. How did you inherit that one? So um, I, I will talk about BP with the caveat that my law firm is uh, counsel to BP, oh, okay. and I, I am recused from matters involving BP. Okay. But at the commission, the BP case uh, arose out of the Deepwater Horizon matter uh, and the, the oil uh, spill into the Gulf of Mexico. and. The case came about uh, by virtue of, obviously, the news reports. The question is, why Philadelphia? Yeah. Uh, I've gotten that question many, many times. And the reason is that we had cultivated an atmosphere where, uh, and an environment where uh, the staff was encouraged to 
look for new matters that suggested possible violations of the securities laws. And back when the Deepwater Horizon event occurred, uh, it was difficult to tell how much oil was flowing into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and from a, a, a reporting and disclosure standpoint, that prompted a staff attorney in the Philadelphia office to question whether or not the company's disclosures about uh, the rate of oil spilling into the Gulf were accurate. Okay. Yeah, so you could just kind of assume that, well, maybe they weren't, I guess. Well, we, we looked at it, and it, it yeah. was, uh, there was an ephemeral aspect to, you. everybody could see the oil gushing out of the pipeline, but, but nobody was quite sure how to measure it. And the right. question was, in fairness uh, to BP, was how do, you, how do you require a disclosure where one might not be possible or 100% accurate? Um, having said that, there was evidence to suggest that that um, that there may have been violations of the securities laws, and as a result, um, you know, these kinds of major events and catastrophes, there the commission felt strongly that uh, companies have in place uh, plans for dealing with these types of events and not to forget their disclosure obligations when it comes to how to report the imp impact of the event. And, yeah. and that's what the BP case signified. It's kind of fascinating. I, there can be securities laws implications to almost anything. That's if, correct. If you look close That's correct. And, yeah. and, and frequently when major news events happen to public companies, it can involve almost anything. But if it affects an investor's interests, then the commission will, will have an interest in it, and the division of enforcement may have an interest in it. And so there, there's almost no conduct in the markets that, that you can look at and conclude that may not have some connection to, uh, to a publicly traded company. Okay. I want to start moving into the, the topic of kind of the reinvention of the enforcement um, function at the SEC. Um, is there anything else from the, the, your Philadelphia period that we should talk about before we get into that? Well, I, I think that for me, the Philadelphia, my experience going into the regions helped give me a very balanced view. Having spent six, six years in the home office uh, doing big cases and then coming into Philadelphia where it had such a terrific history and background of bringing meaningful cases that that when the opportunity to reinvent itself came up for an office like the Philadelphia office it was a it was a critical moment in in its history it was a chance to to do things and a chance to be involved in a way that it had never been before okay. and of course the precipitating event is is the Madoff that's correct event. Um, Talk about the, the pressures that, that hit the SEC and hit enforcement in particular. There were intense pressures during this time period. Um, we had just been through the financial crisis uh, with a lot of uh, volatility in the markets. Uh, the Madoff case came shortly after that, and it really rocked the foundations of the division. Um, it, it, it called, in my judgment, it called into question the culture of the Division of Enforcement and whether or not the division had lost its way um, in terms of how open-minded it was to the possibility that there might be violations that it was missing. And in part, this was a training issue, and in part, it was a, a cultural issue. But it, it was a moment at which the Division of Enforcement had to decide what its future was going to be. And if you look at the cases that were brought in 2008 prior to Madoff, there were substantial enforcement actions across the board. The division was performing at a very high level. Mm -hmm. And there was no general awareness that there were issues concerning how the Division of Enforcement um, would respond to a case like the Madoff case. And I, I think there was 
some division among the senior leadership within the, the career leadership about which, which direction the agency ought to go in following Madoff. I think there was a general recognition, especially when Chairman Shapiro came in, that the system for determining tips, complaints, and referrals, TCRs, and whistleblower complaints needed to be reformed. So when the, uh, the, re the restructuring of the Division of Enforcement began, one of the areas that Rob Kazami was focused on was how to improve the handling of incoming tips, complaints, and referrals. Okay. Just back up a little bit. Sure. You, t you talked about the culture, and it w was it a sense of, I don't want to be too harsh, but was it a sense of arrogance, like, oh, we've got this covered, um, you know, or was it a sense that existing procedures worked well and there really was nothing to change? What was this cultural problem? I, I think there, there, there was difficulty in the way in which whistleblowers came in and the kinds of information that they shared and the staff's willingness to receive that information with, with an open mind. Okay. Um, I think one of the problems that, that the Madoff case illustrated was that um, sometimes somebody might come across in a way that suggests they're not credible, but that in fact they're actually telling a very true and very concerning story. And so it really was in as much a training issue as a cultural issue in terms of being open to the possibility that what somebody is telling you could actually be true and that you need to follow up on those situations very carefully or they can turn into bigger situations that become problematic. Okay. So it's almost an assumption is made by uh, given the, the, the perceived quality of the whistleblower, I guess. I, I think there were assumptions made and about the credibility of, of certain whistleblowers and about how valuable their information was. And I think those were very regrettable. Um, in our office, you know, I worked hard to restructure the way we did incoming TCRs. We, we before the rest of the agency had really gone to this route, we had assigned people, dedicated people, to do nothing but review incoming TCRs. Uh, the Office of Internet Enforcement had done some of that work, and, and each regional office had various people that would handle that. What we did was we formalized it and, and began tracking our incoming TCRs and really began to learn about how to handle TCRs um, in a way that ensured that they would not fall through the cracks. Okay. So you started doing that right away in Philadelphia. We, we did. We um, did. Rob Kazami, of course, has is, is got to look at the entire commission. And is, is he starting a, a similar program with all the other regions? So when he comes in after the Madoff case gets filed, short, a few months after uh, the Madoff case gets filed, Rob uh, began a restructuring program. Uh, where he convened a meeting down in Solomon's Island in Southern Maryland uh, of the leadership of the division, the, the branch chiefs, the assistant directors, associate directors, and uh, regional directors and home office associates. And the leadership got together, and it was a very intense weekend of caucusing, debating, deliberating, uh, hand wringing uh, and and you know other consultations among and between colleagues about where did we want the division of enforcement to go in the wake of these events. I, I think that pretty much everybody accepted that um, as 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 storied and as reputable as the division had become over many many years, that there was some maintenance that was due and that rethinking some of the ways that the division did, did its work made sense. So Rob came in and he shined a spotlight on every corner of the division and, 
and assign different senior uh, officers to run different uh, task forces or groups, working groups, uh, depending on the topic. And my topic was to create the, mark, the Office of Market Intelligence. Okay. Yeah, so TCRs is an, ob an obvious one. Right. Um, did these other, was that part of the six? There were six groups. So there were a number of groups. Um, one was a committee that, did, that focused on the elimination of the branch chiefs and the streamlining of the leadership structure of the division. Another group focused on the establishment of the five specialized units and the Office of Market Intelligence. Uh, I, I ran the task force that headed the Office of Market Intelligence, but, but when the transition was done to the five specialized units, the Office of Market Intelligence was, was integrated into that, into that transition plan. And for me, what that meant was negotiating the consolidation of the Office of Market Surveillance, the Office of Internet Enforcement uh, with, the, with the union. Uh, in order to create a new office within the Division of Enforcement. Okay. And there's also an, a national exam program that emerged from all of this. Correct. And that, and that national, well, national enforcement or national exam? I've got national exam. Yeah, the national yeah. exam program was the program I referred to earlier that Carlo De Florio started. Okay. Where he modeled it loosely on several of the things that Rob Kazami had done in enforcement. Okay. So let's talk about the, your little piece of the, the general reorganization sure. and how, how you approached that. So my piece was really twofold. I, I, was, I was sort of an unofficial member of the group that was debating the establishment of the units. So I, I met frequently with the folks who were conceiving the units um, to give them my input on the kinds of issues that I thought this specialization should focus on. And because of Philly's role in detecting insider trading and in a approaching insider trading cases with a, a, a trader-based approach, uh, the group forming the specialized units was very interested in trying to bring some of that work into the specialized areas. The, um, the other area was municipal securities. Because of our focus on munis, um, it was an area that was ripe for specialization. So. Um, you know, my, and then on top of that, I, you know, was responsible for, uh, I, I sat on an executive committee that Chair Shapiro had established to develop a blueprint for restructuring the way that TCRs came into the agency. And part of my work in, in the task force for OMI was coordinating with the chair's executive committee to ensure that the, that the TCR review policies that the Division of Enforcement implemented were consistent with the chair's objectives in fixing the problems that had led to the Madoff situation. So I was integrally involved in, in the working with Steve Cohen of the chairman's office at the time um, and attending uh, regular weekly meetings to re reform and restructure the manner in which uh, complaints came in through all channels within the agency. Okay. Um, so that, that was really it as far as TCR is just more listening? Uh, uh, well, I mean, it was in, in my role was very, uh, in establishing the Office of Market Intelligence, there was a lot of maneuvering within the Division of Enforcement because all the specialized units were being established at the same time. So we had to negotiate with the union the protocols for how do you reassign people from multiple different offices within the division into a new office that didn't previously exist. Uh -huh. And that entailed negotiations, that entailed uh, working out agreements, 
Um, and it entailed developing policies and procedures that would apply to every regional office and every staff attorney in the Division of Enforcement. Um, and and it, it wasn't just the structure of the office, it was the, it was the purpose of the office, it was its goals, it was how to measure its success, it was the full range of considerations that you would have to navigate in establishing any new office within a, a long-standing federal agency. And the union was a challenge here. The, the union, ironically, the, the union um, became very much a partner in the negotiations for how to set up the Office of Market Intelligence. There were people who had a lot of concerns about how their jobs would change. And the union, I think, was rightly concerned that, um, that as the agency revamped its internal policies and procedures for handling TCRs, that the staff was adequately protected and, and that the policies that were adopted were workable and that people had appropriate supervision and training to get their work done. Uh, I had a very uh, constructive and positive relationship with the NTEU uh, and Carolyn Welshans, who was the uh, negotiator for uh, the NTEU on the OMI agreement, I, I ultimately hired into um, the market abuse unit as a staff attorney and she is now a, an associate director of enforcement. So okay. um, I, I, you know, she was integrally involved in some of the restructuring and has some of that history as well. So this project that you worked on, this, this is what emerged into the market abuse unit, is that right? It, 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 well, the market abuse unit was somewhat separate from OMI. It, it had similarities to it, but it was separate. It was part of this informal consultations that I was having with the, the, the committee, one of the six committees, that, um, that was forming the specialized units. And in that, in that uh, committee, uh, people like David Burgers, Mary Jo Gillette, I Andrew Calamari uh, were, were very involved in trying to decide which of the five, which specialized units should be established, what areas of the enforcement program needed specialization, which areas didn't, how those units would be staffed, how they would operate within the regional offices. There were a host of um, issues regarding reporting lines, regarding who would make decisions on charging decisions and enforcement recommendations, how trial counsels would be assigned. I mean, a range of, of personnel and process issues that had to be thought through by this group of people. And so I, I, I wasn't a member of that committee, but I was, I was very involved in the discussions at the um, at the associate director level concerning how the restructuring would take place and em emerging emerging technologies behind this right correct so yeah. one of the goals that the agency had in restructuring the division was how to make better use of technology in its investigations not just to identify new investigations but to use the technology during investigations and Part of the genesis of the market abuse unit was to begin to incorporate technology into the way in which the unit did its investigations. And I articulated a, a vision for how the market abuse unit could do that uh, and ultimately was selected to be the first chief of that unit. All the while remaining? Uh, director, director of the <laughs> Philadelphia Regional <laughs> Office, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, and that, that was, just to digress for a moment, um, I had a wonderful relationship with all of the directors that I worked, on, worked under. Uh, Rob Kazami was a terrific director. Uh, our deal was that, um, that once he selected me to be the chief of the market abuse unit that I would at some point step down uh, from the regional office. Um, I thought there were many advantages to being in the regional office position while the unit was stood up. And because I could call upon resources from the office to help. And 
um, ultimately did not end up stepping down until months after Rob left, um, much to his, I think, chagrin. Uh, <laughs> but, but we've hugged it out, and, um, and it, it's better now. That's what you get for having a good idea. That, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, let's talk about how that uh, unit worked, um, and particularly through some cases. Sure. Um, I, and I've got a list. Um, I've got the fair financial mm -hmm. case, for example, shows up early. So um, the cases that the unit brought, um, it was obviously we were in a position where um, the pipeline, there was no pipeline of cases. Fair Finance was a case that it was an offering fraud case out of Indiana that had started under the, um, under the Philadelphia Regional Office. Uh, but w when the market abuse unit got started in January of 2010, there, there were a number of issues emerging in the markets concerning high frequency trading, dark pools, um, uh, co-location co of, of servers at the exchange level, um, the role of ATSs, uh, a, a range of market structure issues. But at the time, we, we weren't calling them market structure. We were calling them system issues or mm. um, other mm. types of issues. On May 6th of 19, of I guess it would be 2010, the flash crash happened. Yeah. And we, the market abuse unit, this process of staffing up the units had, that had begun under Rob uh, by, by April of 2010 uh, had been completed. And on May 6th, we were, we were new with a brand new staff, and we had a mandate to look at these system type issues. So the flash crash became a template for us to learn current market structure. And over the course of a weekend in May, beginning May 8th, um, Sanjay Wadwa and I, who's the deputy director of the market abuse unit, um, Rob Cohen and a number of others, uh, rallied to the chairman's all hands call to figure out whether or not an enforcement response to the flash crash was appropriate. What we found was that although there was no conduct that warranted an enforcement response at the time, we, we learned uh, it was an education for us that enabled us to establish and open dozens and dozens of market structure cases relating to the exchanges, the ATSs, broker-dealers, and other market structure related participants that, whose conduct was implicated by various aspects of issues we encountered on the flash crash. So this is almost a trial by fire of, of the, the issues that you were instituted to, to learn about. We, we, the term that we used internally was training by subpoena, <laughs> uh, which I'm not sure the industry would appreciate. But, um, but, what it, but the units were conceived as part investigative operations and part think tanks. And, and the, the goal was taking the lessons learned from the Madoff situation and translating them into new investigative approaches that involved rethinking the way that investigations are done, that involved using technology, incorporating technology into investigations, and that basically was a wholesale re framing of the way that at least the market abuse unit would approach its investigative work. Okay. Um, year after the, the flash crash, you've got uh, the Kluger case, which has an interesting phrase, organized insider Inside. trading. Organized insider trading was a phrase that, that we developed in connection with very deliberate, very willful uh, very intentional insider trading. That there's some insider trading cases where somebody receives information serendipitously and then they use poor judgment and they trade on it. That would be a case where it's not organized, it's just happenstance, it's fortuitous. Organized insider trading, um, sometimes referred as hard to detect insider trading, is trading that is done intentionally 
and deliberately to take advantage of material non-public information in breach of a legal duty. And what we were seeing back to the Estonian spider case that I had first encountered in Philadelphia was a proliferation of trading frauds that sought to take advantage of information but weren't necessarily always insider trading. And through technology and developing new investigative approaches, including the trader-based approach, we began to develop technology within the division in the 2008-2009 timeframe that ultimately became the mandate for the market abuse unit to develop a new approach to how insider trading enforcement is done. So in a case like this, for example, uh, do you remember where that one originated, the, the, the Kluger case? So the Kluger case was very interesting because this was a case involving a middleman. And the SEC had identified trading by the trader in the case many years earlier, but could never prove who his source of information was. And that was because there was a middleman between the trader and Mr. Kluger, who was an attorney at various different law firms throughout the scheme. Mr. Kluger, as an associate in the law firms, had access to, he was an M&A associate, he had access to material non-public information about pending transactions that his law firms were working on. He passed that information to a middleman, who then passed it to a trader. We picked up trading, a trading pattern by, uh, we did not know who Mr. Kluger was. Uh, all we knew was that there was suspicious trading. And we picked up on a, tra a trading pattern by the middleman in innocuous stocks, innocent stocks, where the trading pattern was similar to the trading pattern that the trader used. And once we were able to establish that they both were trading in the same innocent stocks, that pattern established that they likely knew each other and opened up the lead that we needed to figure out where the middleman was getting his information from. And through matters that are non-public, uh, we're able to establish that Mr. Uh, Kluger was the source of the information. Uh, Mr. Kluger, um, ultimately the SEC brought an enforcement action against him. Uh, a criminal case was brought against him and his uh, uh, co-conspirators. Uh, Mr. Kluger received, I think it was 12 years in incarceration, which remains the longest uh, jail term for insider trading. Uh, the in interesting SEC's thing here is, though, how, how you did this. I mean, do, do you just have a a big room full of guys working on computers and, and following, I mean, did, did they have a spreadsheet that says do X, Y, Z, or were they just kind of flying by the seat of their pants they, and they were figuring not, out how to do this? Yeah, they, they, were, they were not flying by the seat of their pants, but they were figuring out how to do this in a systematized, concerted way. Mm -hmm. and there were two aspects to their approach, or our approach. The first was how to engineer an investigative approach that preserved uh, the element of surprise, the government's ability to conduct an investigation uh, covertly. Um, and the second was the technology that that we use to be able to sort through massive bil billions of rows of trading data, trading that's occurring in, in fractions of a second, and be able to organize and surveil that data in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And it was not a room full of guys. It was, although I appreciate the, the visual, it was actually <laughs> uh, a room and a couple guys uh, separated by thousands of miles distance. Uh, I think one, one was in Denver and one was in Philadelphia. And they conceived and developed uh, investigative approaches using different technological tools to be able to identify who the traders were who were trading the same securities. And so 
the first approach was developing the investigative approach, a trader-based approach. And that was a, a change because historically the SEC had really, the SEC is a disclosure-based agency that really begins its inquiries by asking what security is at issue. And its historic approach to insider trading was to look at a security and ask who traded that security. The approach that we developed was really a, tra a, a trader-based security, where instead of looking at the trader and asking who traded, we looked at the, uh, uh, w w look, instead of looking at the security and asking what, uh, what, who traded that security, we looked at who traded the securities and what securities were common to them. And by, do it, by switching this orientation, we were able to see that multiple traders had multiple securities in common to them. And all this did was establish an investigative lead. All it did was establish the possibility that different traders might know each other and might have a common source of information. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. I think you might have mentioned it, but where did that shift happen? It's, it's a really important shift yes. from looking at you know, the individual security to just surveying trading and looking at trading. It, it happened under Linda Thompson uh, in the 2007 to 2008 time frame. Um, there was a group of people within the division that had developed tools called the Single Securities Analysis Tool and the Multiple Securities Analysis Tool that were very crude and sort of uh, staff developed programs that enabled them to sort large amounts of what we call blue sheet data or, or cleared, equity cleared trading data by trader. And it was those initial discussions that resulted in the establishment of what was called the uh, automated Blue Sheet Analysis Project, or ABAP. The SEC staff determined that there were uh, different ways to organize trading data to identify uh, relationships and patterns of trading among traders who potentially knew each other. And that, um, that trading uh, Ab that ability to surveil trading for those kinds of connections and relationships is what unlocked the ability of the market abuse unit to do its work. Gotcha. And that was really the, the, the precondition for creating the market That was abuse. the precondition. Yeah. And it, has, it, it traces its roots back to the Estonian case where we had had right. luck sorting large amounts of data. Okay. Um, another case, Bristol Myers Squibb. And here we have uh, the Obama Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force. So you're, you're working with a, a much larger group here. Correct. So the, the Department of Justice had established, had established the Financial Fraud Task Force, and the SEC was asked to contribute cases to that effort. And through a series of meetings in New York and, and through consultations with different U.S. Attorney's offices, the market abuse unit developed a series of cases. The Bristol Myers Squibb case was one of them. It was actually against an individual, uh, an officer there, uh, who had um, who had traded on material non-public information. What was it like working with this larger group? You know, the SEC enjoys a very close working relationship with its counterparts at the Department of Justice and. In a case like the Ramnarine case or any of the insider trading cases that we did that had a parallel criminal component, the, you know, there are rules that govern parallel proceedings, meaning that the SEC as an independent agency is obligated to bring its own cases for its own reasons based on its own evidence. There are times where it gathers evidence that it thinks might be of interest to criminal authorities and in conjunction with sharing that evidence or making it accessible to the criminal authorities, there are well-established procedures to work closely with them throughout all aspects of their right. investigations. And over time, it, it's become an area 
parallel proceedings are very complicated. They're very procedurally challenging. They have a lot of risk. And they, we really developed a, an expertise in how to manage parallel proceedings during insider trading cases. OK. But this, this Obama Fraud Enforcement Task Force, did that change this relationship in any way? It, did it accentuated and enhanced the DOJ's interest in the work that we were doing. Okay. And they, there were meetings that I recall attending in New York where the task force talked about their objectives. And you know the agencies that attended these discussions were sort of tasked with figuring out how their programs would feed into the, the DOJ program. So it was, it was coordination that was actually already occurring in the ordinary course, um, but that was enhanced and, and amplified under the Obama years. OK. Um, and coming closer to the, the current day, um, there, there's another topic that the market abuse unit took on was something called market structure violations. Correct. Um, which, you know, market structure is constantly evolving. So talk about how you kept up with that constant evolution. So the market structure enforcement, it's, it's very rare for the division of enforcement to develop a whole new type of violation or a whole new program area. And market structure was one of those areas that, in the wake of the flash crash and with the congressional scrutiny that had come with it, um, that the Division of Enforcement develop a much deeper understanding of how the markets operated. And uh, Chairman Shapiro gave a, a, a speech or a testimony before Congress, I believe it was December 8th of 2010, in which she talked about the Division of Enforcement's efforts to police market structure. And that was really the genesis of what we know is the current market structure enforcement program, where the division now pursues cases against broker-dealers, against uh, automated trading systems, against exchanges, against other market participants that seek to leverage the structure of the markets improperly to their advantage. So for example, in, in a case that we brought against the New York Stock Exchange, it involved the release, the dissemination of data to its proprietary subscribers uh, before it released data to the public uh, SIP feed, the Securities Information Processor feed. And that disparity in re releasing data created a perception in the markets that, th there, or there was a perception in the markets that the markets were sort of unfair to retail investors. Right. And the notion that an exchange, a major exchange, was releasing market data to its paying customers before it was being released to the public created concerns that maybe market structure needed to be policed in a more systematic and concerted way. And you got involved in the Facebook IPO thing too. Is that just because it was so high profile? No. I mean, each one of the market structure cases, the cases against the exchanges and, and in the case against NASDAQ for its, its Facebook IPO, it involved crossing trades at the open of its auction for the IPO shares. And there were uh, issues concerning how the trading, opening trading went down and the timing of it and when, sh and when individual trades were actually reported. Uh, and you know, we felt that that was a situation where an exchange in the position of NASDAQ ought to have proceed policies and procedures in place for dealing with those kinds of, of events and, and brought charges on those grounds. Where do you see the market abuse unit going in the future? Well, over the last four years, the unit um, was reoriented a little bit. Half of the folks in the unit were um, 
were reassigned or brought into the cyber unit to police some of the digital asset and cryptocurrency space. Mm. But the two units, as I understand it, maintain uh, the same, because many of the people in the cyber unit came from market abuse, that the two units maintain a relationship and they share the same industry specialists in the analysis and detection center. And they were able to do many of their cases in a coordinated and cohesive fashion. You know, I don't know that you necessarily need um, two, two units like that going forward, but um, I, I would be in favor of, I think the market abuse unit was a great success. Um, I think it brought a lot of important, novel, and, and um, programmatically significant cases. I think if you, I, I watched Andrew Ceresny's, uh oral history before I came here, and he speaks uh, a, a lot about the market structure enforcement work that the market abuse unit did. I worked very closely with Andrew and believe that uh, his tenure as director really established um, the market abuse unit as a force to be reckoned with. Um, I think it remains a very strong and credible unit. I think the units as a whole need some, uh, some um, attention and some, some uh, 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 TLC, uh, to, I think, to reinvigorate them. Uh, but I, I see the market abuse unit continuing, and at least I hope it continues. And I believe that um, the cases that it has brought have been incredibly behavior changing and have had a, a positive impact on the markets as a whole. And now you put this, this thing together, and this uh, raises sort of a, a new twist on, on an old question, which is, you know, the kinds of skill sets, the kinds of people who can do this work could go make a lot of money somewhere else. How did you get them to come and work for the SEC? So I, we, we did it by, I think, articulating a vision of approaching investigations in novel and creative ways and in ways that harken back to what I think is the golden age of the Division of Enforcement, where doctrinal ingenuity, uh, investigative techniques, um, uh, cooperation, basic concepts have always existed in the Division of Enforcement's program. And I'm, I like to think of myself as a student of history and as somebody who's invested in the division's history and that has learned both from its successes and its mistakes. And in fashioning the unit, my vision and under Rob Kazami's mandate was to, was to reinvent the ways that the Division of Enforcement does certain things. You know, I was among a group of senior officers with a foot in both camps. There was a camp of senior officers who did not agree with the elimination of the branch chiefs or the creation of the specialized units. I was a branch chief, and I was very invested in what branch chiefs do um, and believe strongly in their utility and in their role. Um, and, I did, and I had concerns about the elimination of branch chiefs. I did not have concerns about the establishment of specialized units. And the reason why was because I felt like there were at least indications from the Madoff case that suggested that the division needed to rethink the way that it had done things. Not to suggest that the way that it had done things was um, needed to be changed, but I thought it could be improved upon. And I thought that borrowing from some of the lessons learned in the early days of the division made a lot of sense. And it was that approach to sort of articulating a vision that I think attracted really high caliber, top performing people within the division. And the unit gained a reputation for being a desirable place to work. Uh, I think the current leadership of the division, Melissa Hodgman and 
Kelly Gibson, who are both in acting roles at the moment, both uh, worked in the market abuse unit. A number of senior officers, uh, Rob Cohen, uh, Joe Sansone, and others have uh, matric matriculated and been promoted by virtue of the work that they've done in the unit. And so I think people began to see the market abuse unit as a stepping ground, a stepping stone for further advancement in the division. And I think that's one of the things I'm most proudest of. And where's the future for the, the regions then? The Talking about having two feet in, in two different places, I want to want to return to that because that was your first look at the at the at, at things. Um, you know, where's that going? Given given the level of specification yeah. that we're seeing, specialization, what's what's left for the regions? Well, I, I actually think that it's incumbent upon every regional office to know what their strengths are to be um, honest about where they have weaknesses and to harness their energy and strengths in the areas that they are best at. And at the same time, to look for ways to contribute to the national program, both on the exam side and the enforcement side. I think the future of the regional offices is bright. Um, I think that they have benefited from strong leadership over the last four years in particular, and certainly in the years before that. We've not talked about Jim Clarkson, who was the, uh, the head of regional office operations for many years and was a, a major figure in my ascendancy to the job in Philadelphia. Um, the regional offices for years maintained a very close, cohesive relationship among regional directors. The, the regional directors are unique in the agency because they're, I believe, one of the only uh, jobs, senior level jobs, that have two major program areas report to them. So both on the exam side and enforcement side, they have interests in common that really nobody else in the agency has. So that the cohesiveness among the regional directors, the coordination between them and the home office uh, in associates, and then of course the relationship to the front office, to Joe Brenner, to uh, chief counsel, to the deputy director, and to the director themselves. It, to me, you know, the it, it, the future of the regions is is dependent a lot on the ability of the leadership in Washington to tap into the energy and creativity and resourcefulness that exists in the regions. And I think from my vantage point, as somebody who grew up in the home office but then uh, got promoted into senior positions in the regions, you know, I'm very optimistic that the program is as strong as it's ever been today. Let's talk about Jim Clarkson. Sure. <laughs> He's important. He's very important. Um, and it sounds like you had a pretty good relationship. I, I did. Uh, describe him a little bit to me and, and tell, him, tell me uh, you know, how he worked with the regions and kept them on the same page. You know, Jim was, a, um, he was somebody who viewed himself, I think, as safeguarding the core values of the Division of Enforcement um, and, in, and ensuring continuity in the senior leadership roles in the regions. I think when Jim learned that a branch chief from the home office was going to be the head of enforcement in Philadelphia, and then subsequently a year later the regional director, I think it took some getting used to uh, by him, but I think I, I was able to uh, demonstrate that his confidence in me was well placed and um, I worked very closely with him over the years that he was in that role to forge relationships with other regional directors. He, he had a unifying effect on the re, uh, regional offices and he was, he was the regional office presence in DC so that when somebody needed to be in the room as slots were being hand out, handed out or 
as decisions were being made about resources or about priorities, the regions had a voice when those decisions were being made. And Jim was that voice. And in my experience with him, he was um, warm and supportive and mentoring. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think he gets enough credit overall for how important his stewardship was to maintaining the culture and the values in the division of enforcement and, and the overall quality. I'm glad we brought that one up. Anything else that we've missed that we should talk about? Uh, I, you know, I don't think so. I, I, I think the one thing that I've been gone from the agency for almost six years now. And when I reflect back on my time in Philadelphia and in my time in the market abuse unit, I think back to um, a level of energy and commitment that was very exciting to be a part of um, and that had a profound impact on the history of the agency and on the division. And I, I'm very proud to have been there when I was. Terrific place to end. Thank you Great. so much. My pleasure. Thank you.